Hi friends, this is Terry Squires with today's Nashville This Is Faith. I sat down with a precious friend of mine, Lisa Wilcox, battling stage four breast cancer and how God told her to bake cookies. And she'd never baked in her life. And those cookies has transformed her life and the lives of her medical team. And she is leading so many people to Christ. You aren't going to want to miss this episode. Living your life with joy to the fullest is the greatest gift you can give to others. Lisa Wilcox began her cancer journey in February of 2021 with a serious diagnosis of stage four metastatic breast cancer. She felt God telling her to bake cookies for her medical team during treatment. So she did with the aim of being obedient, even though she rarely ventured into the world of baking. Her newfound purpose became a beacon of light in her life, as well as to inspire others that joy can be found even in the darkest of moments because of the love of God. Her act of baking cookies and sharing her faith resulted in several people on her medical team embracing faith. Today, Lisa is still fighting for her life and she's still baking cookies and sharing her faith one cookie at a time. This is her story. This is Today's Nashville. This is Faith. Hi, sweet friend. I am so honored that you are sitting down with me today on Today's Nashville to share your journey. You have been through a lot. Lisa, welcome. Terry, thank you. For, thank you for, first of all, being my friend. When I came to Nashville, I didn't know hardly anybody, and joining your Bible study has saved my life here. Oh. So tell me before um, we get into how you got to Nashville and everything that you've been going through, you were living in... Memphis? Yeah, it? we yeah, we lived in Memphis for nine years. Okay. And my husband worked at the University of Memphis there and, and while I was there I worked as the director for the United Way for director of development. And after that, when did you first find out about the trial that the Lord was going to take you through? And let's talk about what is it? Yeah, so um I was completely healthy in Memphis. However, when we went to Memphis, um we were dealing with a different circumstance with our, one of our children. God really started to prepare me and change me. What in was Memphis. going on with your child? So my daughter, my daughter um, started in college and ended up not liking the university she was in, and she decided to return to Illinois. And we were really heartbroken over that. Um, we weren't. She was dating a young man that we were not fond of. We prayed her back home. And, um, you know, because when a child leaves your house, you have to question, I had to question myself. Like, you know, obviously she wouldn't leave our family and go all the way back to Illinois if I had done a good job parenting her. So I had to do a really lot of self-examination. And um, we joined Bellevue Baptist Church there, which is a mega church, which was Adrian Rogers Church. Mm -hmm. And um, boy, I'll tell you what, my, my faith grew immensely there. And one of the reasons why was they challenged our church, all the members of the church, to read the one-year Bible. You know, I've read the Bible since I was in college, but when I got there, um, it was a different it was a different time in my life because I was worried about my daughter. I wanted, you know, I wanted to mend fences. I wanted to make sure that, you know, I asked for forgiveness. I want, we wanted her to come home and we prayed her back. We prayed her back home. And so that was sort of where God, you know, um, started to really grow my faith. You know, I saw little miracles happening all along the way. So what happened after that? 
So we were there nine and a half years, and while I was there, um, God did all kinds of neat things. I started a small charity um, there. And small charity. It kind of grew into a big charity, didn't it? It did, and it was like, it was a blast. Um, so God put it on my heart when I was in Memphis, opened up a prom uh, organization for these inner city girls because Memphis has a lot of needs, um, and you and they're physical. You can see them. There's an orange mound area, and in some of these houses, you just you just don't know how anybody could be living in there. And so God put it in my heart. I, I told the Lord, I, I'm not really a missionary girl. And, and I thought, I'm a girly girl. What could I do? What could I do to give back to my city that would be like so fun and amazing? And I, he was like, do prom. And I was like, how am I gonna do prom? And so I, I began praying about it. And I, I became friends with a man that was the president of the Rotary Club. And I told him about this idea and he's like, you should do that. So I begin to pray, and lo and behold, I find out there's a international organization there called Allure Bridals. And where are they located? They're headquartered, world headquartered in Memphis, Tennessee. So I come up with a business plan. I call them up. I ask them, Will you, would you be willing to donate some dresses for me so I can gift them to these um, young girls that are unable to go to the prom and they don't want to go to the Goodwill and get a used dress? And so I went and met with the CEO and I rolled out this plan and he said, we're going to think about it. Two days later, he called me back and said, I would love to give to you with dresses. And when I was there, um, he said, in fact, I want you to come to my warehouse. And he gifted me with 2,000 dresses. 2,000 dresses. And the dresses began at between $800 and $1,000. So it was a million, it was like close to a million dollar donation. And so I was, I knew then that it was a God ordained thing because only God could orchestrate that. Here I have zero experience. And so then I thought, well, how am I, how am I gonna, where am I gonna put 2,000 dresses, right? And so I went to my friend who was the Rotary Club guy and I go, I got a big problem. I said, I'm committing to this. I'm talking to these counselors, nine, nine schools, inner city schools, and they're feeding me girls. And now I need a warehouse to hold 2,000 dresses and I need garment racks. And boy, God supplied every single need. I, this man that was into real estate, he um, had a, a warehouse from um, Walgreens, and he said, oh, I'm gonna give you the warehouse, Walgreen, Walgreens warehouse, and you can help put all your dresses in there. And I said, well, I, I don't have any money, and I'm not taking any money, and I'm, no money is changing hands whatsoever, and this is all donation. I have like 50 volunteers helping me, and I'm training all of them, and I'm coming up with this protocol as I go. And um, he said, don't you worry about a thing, I'm gonna pay for the water, the gas, the lighting, all of it for year round. And he did that for me for seven years. Seven years. I never saw a bill, ever. Is there a <laughs> story there that you touched a, a young girl? Do you remember anybody there that you just like touched your heart? There was a girl, her name was Shelby. I mean, Shelby was, she was just beautiful. And you know, she, she didn't have a car. I, I think her mother was nearly homeless. And so when she came to, to get her dress the day that we had the, the event, I said, let me take Shelby. I love Shelby. And so I got to take her. And so what was really cool was by the time I got to her, I said, I I'm not gonna run this program any longer unless you let me share the gospel of Jesus Christ with all these girls. And what they do with that is up to them. But I was able to share that with Shelby, she not only prayed to receive Christ, but she got the most beautiful dress. And I, I'm gonna cry telling the story. That's okay. Um, the Memphis, the Memphis um, newspaper came and I said, can you make Shelby the, the front page of the paper? And they did. Oh, that's so beautiful. it was awesome, you see? know? So she felt like a princess and I, someday I will see her now in heaven. Uh, she'll she'll never forget that. And God has just led you down an amazing path and another journey. True. And we're going to talk about that when we come back. Lisa, what happened when God brought you to Nashville? We moved from um, Memphis to Lexington, Kentucky. 
And when I was in Lexington, Kentucky, um, it was back in November of 20 that I felt I found a lump in my breast. And it was, COVID had just come out and so people were, they were very scared and very worried. And so I called my doctor and she got me in and, but she wasn't able to get me into a mammogram until February of 21. No. So um, some time passed. Well, the day I went in on February 4th of 21, um, I went in and did one mammogram and they said, you need to wait. Then I did a second mammogram and then a third and then a fourth. And then finally this girl came in and she said, you need to clear your schedule the rest of the day. I'm getting the radiologist and we're going to do biopsies. And I knew I was in trouble. Why did they wait so long between the first mammogram to the fourth mammogram? Does it Was it just... No, no, no. This was all in one day. Oh, one day. Okay. One day. Okay. But they weren't able to get me into the hospital between November 20 mm -hmm. until February 21 because of the backlog of all... Was it growing at that time? Or? It's growing. It's getting bigger. I'm, I'm, my, I'm feeling it under my armpit. That, I, that is, you know, might be in lymph glands. And sure enough, the day that I went for all these mammograms, um, they said, we see something in the lymph glands. So when I went in that day, they did seven biopsies. They did uh, four in my, um, under my arm, in my um, lymph gland area, and three, I think, in my breast. And they said, we see two tumors, um, and they're large. The first one was five centimeters, and the other one was a centimeter and a half. And so um, what was concerning was the initial, the initial tumor had broken off into a second tumor, and then it was already in the lymph glands. And so I, I, if I back up and tell you, like, when I found that lump, I, I began to pray. I said, Lord, please don't let this be cancer. And then, you know, I wasn't getting, he was quiet with me, very quiet. And then a few more weeks passed by, like around Christmas time, I prayed again, Lord, please don't let this be cancer. I felt like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's about to be turned in and crucified for our sins. And um, while he's praying, you know, God says no all three times. And so by the time I'm going in for this mammogram, I already know in my heart it's probably going to be cancer because because he's been so quiet with me. So then I begin to pray, please don't let this be bad. Please let this be like stage one or let it be minor. And um, within three days, they, they called and said, we need you to come immediately down to the hospital. We need to get a port in ASAP. And they expedited the process because it was stage 3B and it was in two lymph glands and it was two tumors. And so it propelled me into an entire year of all kinds of treatments. Um, it, they did a thing called the standard of care. And so that required 20 weeks of chemotherapy. The first four was called a series about with the Red Devil, which is a very potent chemotherapy, and then another 16 weeks of Taxol. Then I went through two surgeries to remove all, almost all my lymph glands and the two tumors. Um, we did a lumpectomy the first time, and then I did 35 radiation treatments following that. So I started on February 21, and the treatments ended December 11th of 21. And so they told me everything looks good, you're good to go, and that sort of ended the first go around with, with breast cancer. And you're still in Kentucky? I'm still in Kentucky. But when I first began from the very, very beginning in February, um, I was praying, you know, first you're praying, why me? And God says, why not you? And I said, what do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to bake cookies. And I went, well, that's interesting because I don't bake. And so I thought, I'll go, I'll go to the grocery store and I'll buy, I'll go to, over to the section where they have the bags, where you buy the bags of cookies and I'll, I'll get the co chocolate chip cookies. And so I get these, I bake four dozen cookies, not knowing, you know, how many I'm supposed to bake. I bake four dozen cookies and I put them in individual Tupperware tins. And then I begin to pray again, what else should I do? And he says, I want you to put a Bible verse that you, you sit with me each week 
and I want to give you a Bible verse. And when you go in and you see these doctors and nurses, I want you to talk about me and only me and not about cancer. And I was like, so the first, the first treatment I do, I, I ignore him completely. I feel a little bit like Jonah, like a I'm just not going to do it. You know, is this, this, this is just crazy, right? I can I tell you how terrible that treatment went. I felt sick. I almost got hospitalized. They, they were worried. I was worried that um, I had a, a migraine so bad for four days I couldn't get out of bed. I was so sick I couldn't keep any food down, and they nearly hospitalized me. So the second week I went in, I thought, all right, I'm baking these cookies. I'm going to put these Bible verses on, and we're going to talk about it. And that began the journey of the cookie program. And so um, a lot of times, I mean, seriously, the first six weeks I had done all of that, I wasn't seeing much fruit, you know? Um, and a lot of my nurses and doctors were extremely cautious because they were very worried about the COVID. And so they wore masks, I wore masks. They wore like, you know, like almost like they were going to the moon suits. And um, it was individual. You're individual. You're one on one with your nurse. You're one on one with your doctor. You're not. In a, you're not. You're not in a room with a lot of people at that time. And even in a, the chemo scenario, where typically there's all these chairs, they didn't run it. They didn't run it that way. What they did was they put you in a room singly by yourself. And so that gave me a candid audience to talk individually with each one of these doctors and nurses and people that would prep me up for the, you know, um, surgery. They would, um, you know, um, get my port ready. They would um, take my blood pressure. They would weigh me. They would measure me. And so there was different, like, gates. So each time I was, go was going through a different gate, I was incurring a different person. So it gave me an opportunity to say, look at this Bible verse. What, what God is doing for me he can do it for you too. It's not just for me, it's for everybody. It's for anybody and everybody that will cry out to him. And so what I found during the journey was the cancer patients are already crying out to the Lord and asking for them to heal them. But where I saw the fruits of all of this was when I started talking with my nurses and my doctors individually. And that opened up this door for me to share my faith. And there was an opportunity when I was able to give a Bible away to one of my nurses. And then I knew that I heard what God told me to do. I heard, I knew I heard him right. I knew I heard him, what I, what I was doing was, was right. And then he brought you to Nashville. And shortly after all of that, he, took, he brought me to Nashville. And we're going to talk about what he's doing now yeah. when we come back. Okay. Lisa, God brought you to Nashville on a new journey. What has happened since you've been here? Well, when I got here to Nashville, um, my cancer had returned. And so, you know, I, I was hoping they had got it all the first time. And so um, when I got here, I had uh, a rash that had covered my breast. And so I immediately went to a doctor here. Um, it started really in May, but I found out I was moving from Lexington to um, here to Nashville. And I thought, well, I might as well find a doctor here, you know, since we're moving to Nashville. And so I waited. And so by the time I got here, my, my breast was covered in this rash. And so I went and saw a doctor and he looked at it and he said, has anything transpired prior to this? And I told him that I had had breast cancer. And he said, you gotta get to an oncologist. So I got to an oncologist. And um, she got me into, she said, well, obviously everything they did the first go around didn't work. And so that propelled me into all these tests. And um, she said, okay, the tumor is now 10 centimeters, 10 to 11 centimeters. And she put me on a trial drug. And I did that drug. I did that test for 10 and a half months. But again, I, I went back and I, you know, started praying. And I said, what should I do, Lord? And he said, you know what to do. You know exactly what to do. And the reason why I know is because back in Lexington, one of my nurses, um, when I was there in Lexington, after about eight weeks, we were talking each week about these Bible verses. And so um, 
she said to me, her name was Renetta. She said to me one day, she said, you know, I live with a man. And I said, okay. And I said, I'm not, I'm not your judge. I'm not your jury. I'm not God. Um, and I said, so that's between you and him. And so I got to the point with Renetta where I said to her one day, I said, Renetta, can I, can I give you a Bible? And she said, yeah. And I said, so the next week I bring her this one year Bible. And I said, as we dialogue, I said, each week I see her, I said to her, what do you think about the story of, you know, Balaam? What do you think about this, all these stories? So we started talking about them. And um, she would say, I don't understand this. And I kind of explained it to her the best, you know, I said, I'm no scholar, but this, this is what I'm gleaning from it. What do you think? And one day I came in and she said, sit down. And I sat down and she goes, I want to show you something. And she pulled up a picture and on this, on her phone, she was dressed in all white. And I went, you got married. And she goes, no, ma'am, I got baptized and I got saved because I read that book you gave me. And she said, and I kicked that man out. And I was like, I heard him right. And that solidified that no matter where I go, no matter what I'm going to do, I'm going to share God's love. I'm going to bake these cookies and I'm going to talk about him. And so when I came to Nashville, I started breaking the cookies and I saw this gentleman, he was um, a valet and I'm walking, I'm walking up and he's running back and forth and back and forth. And I, I stop him and I said, you have the nicest smile. You have such a good attitude. I've, I, I've been observing you. And so I asked him what kind of cookies he liked. And so I, I, the next week I brought him, I started baking 14 dozen cookies and I started with the valet team and his name was Greg. And so I got to the point with Greg one day where I said, he said, you know, my grandmother used to talk about Jesus to me all the time, read the Bible to me. And I said, do you still read the Bible, Greg? And he said, not really. And I said, can I buy you a Bible? Can I bring you a Bible? And he said, I would like that. So I brought him a Bible. He told his person, you know, this team of people that work with him, this girl bought me this Bible. And so now TJ and Greg and Patrick, they all, they all have their Bibles. And so there's a group of five of them. So what this journey's done for me is allowed me to meet these amazing people. And that went on for 10 months. So I know, I know all about their families. And it's not just them, it's, it's, my, it's my nurses and my doctors. One of my nurses, her name's Kimberly. She took the Bible verses off of the, off the cookies and she brought me in to the back nurse where all the nurses go. And she had taken all these Bible verses and put them on top of the cabinets every week. And I have a picture of it. And I mean, I just thought God's word does not go away void. It doesn't ever go away void. Through this whole process and the journey that he's taken, he's, you've started a, a ministry, the Faithful Cookie Company. Yeah. Tell me about it. As a result of this, several people encouraged me, including you, including my, the Bible study that I'm in here in the neighborhood. So we launched Faithful Cookie Company in October. And it's strictly... The ministry is really, um, I said, if we start the ministry, part of the money from this ministry, I'm going to buy gas cards and grocery cards for cancer patients because I'm finding that they, you know, they struggle paying their bills. But the caveat was I'm going to find out where they're being treated medically and I'm going to send 10 to 12 dozen cookies to their medical teams. And then I'm going to find out, you know, get, try to get to know them. And if I have the opportunity to give them Bibles, I will. Because through this journey, I've probably given out 40 Bibles. I've prayed with people. I've hugged people. I've loved people. And so, like, it's been such an amazing journey. And we wanted to name it Faithful because we wanted to be faithful to the Lord, faithful to the community, the medical community, and faithful to others. And so... And you have a Bible verse, your favorite Bible verse. My favorite Bible verse is 1 Peter 5.10. And that was sort of a promise that God gave me when I got cancer the second time. I was reading it one day and I thought, I'm not really sure what's going to happen to me. And so 
it just leapt off the page to me. And so I don't know exactly, I don't know what God's going to do with that Bible verse with me because what is it? he says, I will confirm, I will help, and I will establish you. And I'm like, what does that mean? What does that mean? I don't know what that means, but I'm, I'm standing and trusting him. And another Bible verse that really I've clung to during this second round is been Psalm 37, 5. And it says, you know, commit all of your ways. So commit your journey, commit your cancer journey to the Lord, commit your business to the Lord. And then the qualifier is commit, then trust him. And then he, the Lord, will help you. So I think those, I, I look at those verses and claim them all the time. You know, Lisa, we only have a few seconds left, but you bring so much joy into other people's lives. You have no idea how God is using you. And I just, I just love you. I love you. I love, I'm so happy I got, to, I'm so like, I kicked and screamed coming to Nashville. I said, it's expensive. I don't want to go, but boy, did God have some awesome plans for me to meet that valet team, the medical team. Yeah, and your cookie company. And the cookies, all of it. FaithfulCookieCompany.com. Right? That's right. And they can go there. They sure can. And help your ministry. That would be awesome. Lisa, thank you. Love, love you. you. Love you too. My friend, are you going through a trial and a struggle and you don't know what's going to happen to your life? Like Lisa did, listen to the Lord. He's going to direct your path. This is Today's Nashville. This is Faith. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.